Welcome everyone to our weekly chat with Toronto's Associate Medical Officer of Health. Dr. Vinita Dubey, thank you so much for joining us again today. Hi, how are you? I'm well. My name is Dilshad Berman. I am a writer and reporter with City and 680 News and I will be moderating this chat today. How it works is we've been collecting your questions all week and the doctor has never seen them before. This is the first time we're going to present them to her. Um, if you haven't had a chance to submit your questions, you can still do so under this live broadcast and we'll try to get to as many as we can in this short half hour period that we have with the doctor. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to get started right away with the submitted questions and then as they come in live, I'll take them uh, as they come. So doctor, are you ready to go? Yeah, let's go. All right, let's get started. We are gonna start again this week with vaccine questions because vaccines are top of mind for a lot of people as the rollouts continue. Um, so let's start with Ray's question. Ray's asks, how are we tracking the side effects of the vaccine? I had my second one yesterday and following the first one, my hormones were all over the place. Um, and then I was lethargic and my moods were unusual. Okay, so uh, good question. Um, you can actually expect to get uh, side effects more often after the second dose of the vaccine, actually. Uh, we know that 40% um, more, uh, more common to get uh, side effects after the second dose, and sometimes that's related to, we think, um, an additional boosting uh, of the vaccine. We see that with some other vaccines, like one of the shingles vaccines as well. It's the second dose that gives you um, more of the side effects. We know those side effects tend to last one to three days, though, but I, in speaking with some of my colleagues who work in the emergency department, some have um, had a fever or real muscle aches or a headache, but they did get better within one to three days. Uh, if you have a, a side effect uh, from the vaccine, then you can actually report it to your doctor who can report it to the local public health unit. You can actually report it directly to the local public health department as well. And uh, it's actually a requirement for uh, physicians to report uh, side effects that they determine related to the vaccine. And what we do in local public health is we actually do investigations and then we report it to the province. The province reports it federally. And you'll see that on the Public Health Agency of Canada, there's a website, uh, a dashboard that's updated every week with uh, these updated numbers. Okay, wonderful. So there is actually a uh, follow up and a tracking system in place for side effects. That's right. And I, the reason why I think it's such a good question is because we want to be sure that the vaccine continues to be safe. And so we know sometimes in the clinical trials where they have thousands of people, they don't have millions of people. And so we know sometimes when you give a vaccine to millions of people, uh, rare side effects may come up and we want to continue to make sure that the vaccine is safe. And so that's why we're, we're constantly monitoring, monitoring this. And so we want you to let us know, especially if you have a severe side effect. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. And then um, let's go on to Gwen. Uh, Gwen and Terry actually have a similar question. So I'll just read out Terry's. Uh, Terry says, how many people are getting side effects from the vaccine and how many people have actually died from the vaccine if we've had deaths from the vaccine? Okay, so on the Public Health Agency of Canada website, I, I was actually on it, and it actually talks about um, some people who have died after receiving the vaccine. The question is, did they die because of the vaccine? And as you know, we're giving the vaccine in long-term care homes. Uh, we know that uh, people are older who live there. People may naturally die or die of other causes. And so there have been deaths reported after the vaccine. The deaths have not seen to be because of the vaccine. It was either because of some other underlying condition I know uh, that we've done some of those investigations ourselves in, in the city. Uh, so that's um, that piece. Um, sorry, what was the first question? The first part the first to it? The question was how many people are getting side effects? And the second part was how many people have died? Yeah, so in general, the side effects are, though, rare. Like, you know, uh, less than 10% of people get, you know, um, the side effects, if they get it, they tend to be the, the sore arm, the fever, the headache, the not feeling very well. Those tend to be the more common of the side effects, but certainly not everyone has a side effect. And, and again, the vast majority of side effects resolve within three days. Okay. Um, and Wings has a question. Wings is a regular contributor to our Q&A sessions. Um, they ask, what are the pros and cons of a messenger RNA uh, as compared to a conventional dead virus vaccine? Okay, well, the messenger RNA is your instruction manual. And so, um, uh, so it actually then 
causes your body to develop an immune response by giving your body instructions. The reason why that's helpful uh, is because actually in the production of the vaccine, it means that you need different production technology. It means that maybe you can produce the vaccine faster and get it rolled out, which is something that we've seen with this vaccine. Compared to um, all, there, are, I mean, there are tons of other kinds of vaccines. The question was about a dead virus vaccine. We use, um, we call them live attenuated vaccines. Um, the measles, mumps, rubella is one of those vaccines. Um, and so it's, it, it's just a different type of production to make that vaccine. You have to prove that it's safe. Sometimes with those live attenuated vaccines, you actually can't give those at all to someone who has a weakened immune system because there's always that risk that um, they could get uh, a type of uh, infection from them. So I think the messenger RNA vaccine will prove to be able to be safer in more uh, people compared to a live attenuated vaccine. Okay. And actually, uh, this is not a vaccine question, but it's coming in live right now. So let's take it from Susan. Um, Susan asks, why can the public not purchase at home antigen testing kits? So the testing is approved by Health Canada, the test kits that are available. Uh, uh, and you've seen that there are a number of rapid test kits that continue to be approved by Health Canada. So it will be up to whatever kits are on the market for them to seek approval from Health Canada for Health Canada to approve it, for it to be available um, like an at-home at -home test kit. Um, the way the technology is going, the way things are being produced uh, and approved, you can expect that there may be something like that down the, down the road. Okay, and then another actual uh, live question that's coming in, uh, this one is about vac vaccines. Uh, Naomi asks, if I have allergies and interstitial cysts, can I take the vaccine for COVID-19? Uh, probably, yes. I would say, based on what you said, the allergy that you have to be concerned with is if uh, you have an allergy to PEG, polyethylene glycol, or if you get uh, Moderna, tromethamine. Uh, if you have an allergy to any of the ingredients, uh, those are the main ones that you really have to be concerned with. But there's no egg, there's no antibiotic, there's no human cells, there's no animal cells. There's a lot of things that are not in the vaccine. So if you have any food allergy, it doesn't mean that you can't get the vaccine. It's the, the allergies are very, very specific. And even still, you have to have a severe allergic reaction to any of the ingredients to be considered um, contraindicated where you can't get that vaccine. Now, what I would say is talk to your, your doctor, your nurse practitioner, your healthcare provider about this if you have questions. Yes, absolutely. And actually, we had another question about penicillin. Um, Francis asks, can you take the vaccine if you're allergic to penicillin? Absolutely. So um, any, if you have any antibiotic allergies, uh, they're not contraindicated uh, with, this, with, the, with the two vaccines that we have available. Okay, wonderful. Um, we just have a comment right now that says hashtag vegan vaccine, <laughs> which is what, you, what we've been talking about is that it doesn't have um, a lot of people are concerned that it might have fetal cells, that it might have an egg and things like that, and none of that is in the vaccine. That's right. We've even be a been asked, is the vaccine uh, halal or kosher? And while, you know, I really can't certify the vaccine, uh, you know, that's really up to your religious organizations to do that. I can say what's not in the vaccine. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Um, we'll go back to the submitted questions now. Um, let's see. Uh, the uh, Layla asks, this is uh, something that we've been asked a couple of times now, are there any risks for uh, females and their fertility when it comes to the vaccine? Uh, there have been uh, no uh, indications that the vaccine will impact uh, fertility, uh, not at all. Okay, okay. Um, and then Jacqueline uh, says, this is very scary. Wasn't the vaccine supposed to be a two-part injection program that has a specific time frame? So now that we have a shortage in Canada, um, for those who did get the one dose, is that still going to be effective? Um, and then the second part of the question is, will the vaccine work against variants? Okay, so uh, in Ontario, we are still giving two doses of the vaccine. I know in other parts of Canada, uh, they're giving one dose and maybe delaying that second dose. In Ontario, there is a delay because there's a shortage, but 
Uh, the guidelines are that you give the second dose within 42 days. And so that is the, the time frame that's being used uh, to get that second dose. So, and that's part of the planning. If you give someone one dose, you have to make sure that, uh, you know, in within 42 days, you're going to have a second dose available to provide to them. And then with regards to the variants, um, I think I don't think it's a yes or no question. Um, maybe if the vaccines might not be as effective against the variants, they might still provide protection. There are many variants out there. We've heard of the UK, the South African and the Brazil variants. Um, and we've heard that maybe in parts of the, the world, like maybe in South Africa, the vaccine that they have there right now might not be effective, but maybe another vaccine might be effective. So I think this is something that we have to, to monitor. How well will the vaccine protect against variants? Uh, maybe if it doesn't provide full protection, can it provide some protection? And as well, can we then modify the vaccine? The vaccine's messenger RNA, it's against the spike protein. Can we modify that messenger RNA to adapt to the variant spike protein uh, and give you a booster dose um, down the line? So those are all the kinds of things that we're looking into. Right. Okay. And again, I mean, like, as we go along, things are developing, things are moving, I guess, and you said this a lot, it's a wait and see, right, depending on what variants come about, how we can modify the vaccine, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So currently, we have the two vaccines that are approved, Moderna and Pfizer, um, they're good for the current COVID-19 variant. Uh, and then it's a wait and see, right? Yeah, they're good for the current. And I think the important point to say is right now uh, in Ontario anyways, while variants are present, uh, they're not the predominant strain. And so getting vaccinated will still protect you, uh, we think, uh, by and large against the COVID that is spreading here. Okay, okay. Um, and then I have a bunch of questions actually that are all about timelines. And I'm not sure we really know much about timelines, but I'll just ask them in sort of in one go. When are school staff uh, getting the shot? When are seniors in private apartments getting the shot? When are healthy young people in their 20s and 30s getting the shot? Um, and how will people get contacted to know that it's their turn? Okay, so um, recently what came out was uh, the next stage is going to include um, some healthcare workers, but also those who are 80 plus. Uh, who live in the community. So we're still finishing long-term care homes, retirement homes um, will be added as well. Not every retirement home has had someone, but the 80 plus in the community will be uh, next in line, so to speak, from a community perspective. So that's good news. We know that um, age is actually one of the the biggest risk factors we say, like the older you are, if you get COVID, you can get very severe COVID. So uh, now the question is, okay, I'm 83. How will I know that my time is up? Well, I would say uh, there will be a number of ways to for you to hear the news. Uh, we're, the province is using the system called COVAX, which is an online um, system to record when people get vaccinated. It also will have an appointment system. So either it might be an online system where you sign up. It might be that there's a call center if you don't have online that you could call and say, book me in. Mm -hmm. um, and then when you show up for the vaccine clinic, you can expect to bring some sort of uh, proof that you really are that age so that, you know, anyone can't just say, oh, I'm 83 and I want to get the vaccine. Uh, but there will be... Um, you know, when it's your time, there will be a lot of messaging to let you know how you can sign up to get it. Uh, and the other thing is down the line, we're uh, hoping that uh, other healthcare providers will be able to have the vaccine as well in their offices and their clinics. Uh, to, and so, you know, that will also make it easier down the line. Right. Now for the other groups, uh, teachers, uh, young, healthy adults, um, you know, Sometime in 2021, we're hopeful that we can be able to vaccinate uh, as many. Um, again, a lot of it is dependent upon supply. Uh, the, the second stage, uh, based on the province's framework, is until July. And so the next step, frontline workers were included in there, um, as well as other older adults, for example. Uh, that would be somewhere between March and, and July. Okay. Or April and July. Yep. Okay. And so then we're looking um, at just like you said, young, healthy adults, we're looking at July and beyond, probably. Probably, yes, that's right. August into August and beyond. Yeah. Okay. Uh, oh, another live question coming in here. Uh, Safi asks, if I only want the Moderna vaccine uh, from and no other vaccine from no other manufacturer, is that an option for me? 
Right now, it's not an option. Right now, there is no ability to choose what vaccine uh, you want. Uh, whatever vaccine is available, the Pfizer or Moderna, that's what's going out into long-term care homes, for example, or uh, vaccinating hospital workers. Uh, so, um, and uh, certainly some of the supplies of each of the vaccines, you know, some area may get just one vaccine and not another. And so it may not actually be, be a choice for you currently. Doctor, is there a reason to choose one over the other? In, you know, is Pfizer better? Is Moderna better? Is there actually a reason that people should be concerned about which vaccine they're getting? Uh, I, I don't think so. Personally, my professional opinion is no. They're 94, 95% efficacy, so very equivalent. Mm -hmm. The one reason why you might ch choose um, not to get Moderna is if you have that tromethamine allergy, but again, that's a very rare allergy. So otherwise, between the two, they are considered equivalent. Okay, okay. Um, and then let's go, oh, we didn't cover this one uh, actually in the timeline, so I will ask because it's slightly separate. Constantina asks, um, she's a cancer patient and wants to know when cancer patients uh, will get the vaccine. Is that in the second stage? Again, we're waiting for some more information to come out publicly on that um, so that you can understand where you might fit, fit in there. Right, okay. Uh, and then Frank says, um, this is sort of a travel question related to the vaccine, but he's, he says it's a longer term question. If and when traveling is allowed in the long term, um, there are different vaccines in different countries. India has a different vaccine of its own locally, China, Russia, they have different vaccines, um, and they might not be approved by Health Canada or the FDA in the US. So will people who have those vaccines be allowed into Canada and be allowed to travel? I know it's kind of a federal question, but perhaps you can give us some insight. Yeah, I guess the question is, at what point will vaccination be a requirement for travel? And yeah. at that point, when it's required, will they will uh, they require a specific brand of vaccine? I can't imagine that that would be the case, because as you've said, there's different vaccines available. Not every country has access to Pfizer or Moderna. Yeah. Even, in, even in Canada, we may have the AstraZeneca vaccine, and not everyone, uh, depending upon who, if it's available, you may not, uh, you may get a different vaccine from your neighbor or even from someone else that lives in your home. So yeah, um, we'll have to wait and see, but uh, the World Health Organization has played a role as well in you know, trying to help ensure that vaccines are available in all countries, that they're um, that COVAX vaccine. So um, you know, I, I think we, as long as it's kind of a certified vaccine, it should provide, provide evidence of effectiveness. And we've seen with other vaccines like the measles vaccine or the polio vaccine that it's provided around the world. It's made in different places around the world. It's licensed differently, uh, but still considered uh, effective. Right. Okay, uh, we have another live question coming in today uh, from Jessica. Jessica says, if there's no proof that the vaccine can mitigate transmission and won't stop you from getting the virus uh, and hasn't been approved by the FDA, then how can we ensure its safety and efficacy? So what we, what we don't know right now is if it will, if you can get uh, an infection without symptoms, an asymptomatic infection, and without you being sick, you could spread that to others. That's the part that we don't know about yet. But what we do know is that the vaccine will help you be protected against illness, severe illness. Um, and so we do know that the vaccine will protect you against, against an illness. It's just that piece of if you have COVID and you have no symptoms, because we know that COVID can be asymptomatic in some people, Will the vaccine protect against that infection? And that's the part that we don't know yet. Okay. Um, and then another live question, actually from my colleague, Christine, uh, on our web desk. Um, she asks, is there a concern that the variants will continue to mutate and make the current vaccines completely obsolete and then we'll be back to square one? I mean, certainly that's always a concern, right? Uh, but we do see, I mean, if you think about something like the flu virus, we know that the flu virus uh, mutates, it changes every year. We have a different vaccine every year. But we know that even if we have a vaccine in one season and the virus changes within that season, if you were vaccinated, often you can have what we call cross protection. And so while it might not be the full protection, it can still provide um, some protection. And so it, it, the likelihood right now, based on 
what we know with uh, the changes in the spike protein for the variants, the likelihood that the vaccine that we're getting right now will provide zero protection is low. It's more likely that if it doesn't provide the full protection, it, it will provide some. Some protection, okay. okay. Um, and then let's move on to the submitted questions again. Uh, we've got a question from Shailene. The, uh, he is also a regular contributor to our chats. Um, his first question about the vaccine is if the vaccines, uh, this is similar to the transmission question we just had actually, if the vaccines prevent people from getting sick with coronavirus, can they also prevent people from carrying the virus and infecting others? And I think you just mentioned this, but good to reiterate. Yeah, so uh, we, we don't know that. Now, on the one hand, though, preventing the illness and from getting sick is also going to prevent, uh, hopefully, that transmission as well. Because, um, you know, if you don't get sick from the virus, then um, the, the, the sickness from when you're coughing and sneezing you know, or, uh, you know, being sick, that that, that, that transmission will, be, will uh, not occur. But it's that asymptomatic uh, transmission piece that we're still waiting for the, the data on. Right, absolutely. Um, and then uh, Charlie asks, and again, this is sort of a timeline question, why are people who don't deal with patients and, and the higher ups at hospitals getting their COVID vaccine before seniors and frontline workers? So um, uh, this is a question for uh, who has been eligible for the vaccine. Right. And we're seeing that as more evidence comes in, as uh, more of the working groups are providing recommendations, even um, you know, one of the, the committees that I sit on, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, just this past weekend released updated uh, guidance on prioritization and who should get the vaccine. So, um, you know, as more information is coming, as we know more about the supply, some of that who should be getting the vaccine is being modified. Right, absolutely. Um, and then this one, is, this is a sort of a popular question and happens a lot and it might be based on, on not evidence. So I'm just gonna ask it, but let's see. Um, Nick asks, why do we even need a vaccine if the virus has a 99.9% .9 recovery rate? Okay, so the virus, as, uh, the data that I've seen shows that the virus does not have that high a recovery rate. Um, we know that um, at least for severe illness, uh, maybe 10 to 15% of people who are positive uh, can get a severe illness. We know that uh, many uh, have died, especially the elderly have died from the virus. And so death is not a recovery rate as far as I'm concerned. So th that's the reason for the virus is because it will continue. That's the reason for the vaccine because the virus will continue to spread. Um, and we've seen uh, in the second wave that even people who were not otherwise sick, people who might who were healthy, got sick, ended up in hospital. Uh, some even died. And so um, that's really uh, the reason for the vaccine. Right. And I mean, just on a personal note, recovery might be possible, but why do you want to get it in the first place? <laughs> why would you want to take that risk is my contention for that. And, and uh, I think that, that, you know, no matter what the recovery rate is, you just you don't want. Why do you want to get sick? Who wants to get sick? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Yeah, and as a public health doctor, thank you for saying that, because my goal really is prevention. And so if you can prevent it, uh, uh, we're better off. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And then we actually have another question. So we're done with our vaccine questions for today. But if you still have vaccine questions, please submit them. We will get to them. I'm just moving on from uh, onto the submitted questions now. Just a mixed bag of questions. Another question from Charlie. Uh, why are hockey players allowed to play and travel across the country, but just regular people are told don't travel, no, no sports, you know, because they're spreading COVID. Well, I can say that um, I have personally looked at uh, the NHL's return to play protocol for uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs because they are part of Toronto um, and have had back and forth uh, with um, um, the team and the league on uh, protocols to reduce the spread of COVID-19. And so um, nothing is without risk, um, but there are certainly many, many, many layers of uh, preventative steps in place in the protocols to reduce the spread of COVID uh, for those who are playing uh, that professional sport. Uh, in our um, regulations right now, professional athletes and athletes that are, say, preparing to go to the Olympics are allowed to uh, train and play if their protocols have been approved by uh, the C Chief Medical Officer, Medical Officer of Health. 
Okay, and and just uh, I mean, one of the many protocols I think is that they get tested every day or every two days. Every something? day, every day they have an every day, uh, and it's a PCR test. Um, but on top of that, uh, they have masks. It's very clear what kind of masks they have to wear. They have um, guidelines on physical distancing. They can uh, be fined or have uh, penalties if they don't follow. Um, uh, so there are a lot of other other uh, considerations that are made in the protocols. That they're not allowed to eat in restaurants, for example, if restaurants were to be open. There are a lot of a lot of things that they have to follow um, and are required to follow in order to be able to play. Right. Absolutely. Um, and then uh, coming back to Shailendra, actually, he has a couple of more non-vaccine questions. Uh, one is, if a pregnant woman gets COVID-19, can the baby be infected or uh, can the baby be infected through breastfeeding? So it doesn't seem that the vaccine, that the infection is spread through breast milk. Um, but if a mother is contagious um, and she's breastfeeding her child, it, that's close contact. And that's probably how it's spread. Um, but it's not necessarily, it doesn't seem to be spread through the breast milk. Um, in terms of if a baby's inside, can a mother pass it to the baby? That seems to be less likely as well. But the woman um, or, or the pregnant person themselves uh, can get sick. And we, we didn't know before. Before, before we didn't think that they could get a sicker with COVID, but now it's it's clear that a pregnancy does can lead to a more severe illness. Okay, it can lead to a more severe illness, but does it make you more likely to catch COVID? Uh, that's it's hard to answer that question. Uh, I think if um, if you were exposed, same as anyone, um, when you're pregnant, you might ha have a weakened immune system. That sometimes happen with pregnancy. So um, it's hard to really answer that question, whether you're more likely to get COVID, probably not, but you have to take precautions like everyone else. But if you got COVID, you could get a more severe illness. Right, okay. Um, and then the other question is, um, can someone who died from coronavirus still donate their organs? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that, but I can certainly look it up and find out. Uh, organ do donation, um, usually if you have an acute uh, infectious disease, you are excluded from donating organs because we don't want um, the infection from one person to spread to the other. So that's usually um, the case. Um, so I can certainly look that up and, and report back next week on that. Definitely. That's a good question. We've never had that one before. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, let's move on to a couple of questions from Karen. Um, Karen asks, why can a nurse wearing an N95 and all that personal protective equipment take care of a patient in an LTC facility, but if, if we are wearing the same masks and gowns, we, we can't visit? Uh, so there, I mean, the the, the visiting rules uh, have changed. They're different from what they were in terms of a restrictive. I um, I think the one important thing is people uh, think that there's something magical about an N95, but half of the magic with it is being able to wear it properly and being trained in wearing proper personal protective equipment. And so just giving you know a visitor an N95 and a gown and say, okay, now you can visit uh, safely. We see with just our regular cloth masks that they're not being worn properly. And so that's part of why we can't say that there's there's no risk. I'll give you the personal protective equipment and you can go and visit. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I mean, nurses and people who are taking care of people in LTCs are necessary. I would assume that you'd want to reduce the exposure to anything else that wasn't, anybody else that wasn't necessary, right? That's right, especially in times when there might be an outbreak in the facility or more cases, you want to be able to limit as much as you can any chances for COVID to, to come in. Right, exactly. Um, and then, let's see, uh, Terry says, what are the infection figures of COVID versus influenza, I guess this year, um, and the hundreds of variants that come in with regular influenza? So how is this any different when it comes to variants? Okay, so uh, I mean, influenza is very, very, very low levels. Uh, I, in my career, I can't ever think of a season when we had very, very little influenza during flu season. This is flu season, but we've certainly seen uh, thousands and thousands of COVID cases. Uh, so that's the case. We do know with influenza that uh, there can actually be more than one strain that spreads. Usually what we see is 
December, January, there's a peak and then a fall. Usually that's one particular strain, usually an influenza A. And then later on in the season, we'll see another peak and that's usually influenza B. So there are multiple strains that can spread um, within a year. Um, and that's why the vaccine actually usually has uh, three or four strains to protect you against uh, what um, maybe maybe circulating that year. Um, and then, yeah, influenza virus mutates um, and it can mutate within, the, within a season. Um, and actually that's what all viruses do. So even COVID is mutating um, similar to, to the flu virus. Um, but right now for COVID, we've had one predominant strain in Canada. And now with the variants, we might have additional uh, strains spreading. Right. So it is, I mean, like you said, there are variants, it is happening. It's not really different from other viruses. It's doing what viruses do. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And then uh, this is just a simple one. Marilyn asks, if you have sinus infections, should you take the virus test? Uh, if you have, so what we say is if you have a newer worsening symptom, so, you know, if you've had a sinus infection for a long time and you know that that's what it is, then no, not necessary to get tested. But if you've had a change in your symptoms and you can't be sure um, that it's just from the sinuses, I would absolutely encourage you to get tested. Okay, absolutely. And actually we're at one o'clock. That half hour went by really fast. I didn't even notice. Thank you, doctor, for answering that last question. Um, that's all we have time for today. Thank you everybody for joining in and for all your great live questions. We will have the doctor back with us next week and we'll get to the rest of the questions then. Thank you so much, doctor. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.